I'm going to jump into some, some roof layouts uh, quickly. On page 11 in the green book, you will see one of the most common questions we get is where do we put the first row? And where do we put the second row, third row, etc.? cetera? Um, Rob kind of went over that, and some people want to know the math. There is an equation in there, which you see here on my screen, that shows that math, and that is on page 11. Um, the first row, basically, six to 12 inches from the eave. It comes down to how much snow do you really want to fall off that roof? Um, or how strong is your gutter that's gonna hold that foot of snow on the end? The second row, you can use the math, um, and third and on up. It's not mandatory to use that math. You keep it in the lower portions of the roof. And there are some, some things in design and layout which I was hoping to find some roof plans that would show a little more what I wanted to illustrate. But you'll, you'll find geometries on roofs where, where maybe you want to set that second row even with a roof that's set back on another, on another plane so that it looks nice all the way across. You can get down to some aesthetic things in layout as opposed to just using math. Um, a good example of that you've got right there on the screen. If, see that green line? If this roof had called for two rows here and you were using that MCA book and it said, well, put the second row right here, notice it intersects this dormer like right in the middle here. Well, there's nothing that says that aesthetically you can move it up to the point of that dormer, you know, if aesthetically that looks. This is a little more art than science, you know, than what's in that green book or just some guidelines, but you can alter those a little for aesthetic reasons to, to line things up better if you want to. So you, you have a cold eave overhang, right. and you're concerned about ice damming where you have a six-foot cold eave overhang. Where should you put the snow retention? Or are you worried about the fact that you have a cantilevered condition there with no support? I'm not sure which. It does have support. Yeah, sometimes there are people there when they're not supposed to be or when, you know, it's the same situation I pointed out earlier. They don't always walk where they're supposed to walk and so on. So there's no harm in redundance. You know, there's no harm at all in redundance. Just because the calculation says you need one row, it doesn't mean you have to be married to that. You can use two rows. And a lot of times, like if you're using a 16-inch panel and, and you use two rows, and it calculates that you need only one row, but you need a clamp on every second seam, which that calculator will tell you if that's the case. So now you can use two rows, or it may tell you you need a clamp on every seam, is what I'm meaning to say. But now you cheat, you cheat the calculator, you put two rows in there, which it won't, it won't give you that answer, you know, unless you finagle some numbers. But you know that, OK, I can put two rows up here, but I can skip seams. So it saves a little money that, w that way. But there's no harm ever in redundancy. And sometimes you have architects. We've had cases where the calculator will prove that it only needs two rows, but there's, a there's an engineer involved or an architect says, no, this is really, you know, this is six stories high, and I want to be sure and put as many as four or five rows on there. No, no harm in that. We'll sell you the extra parts. We don't object. <laughs> so there's no harm in redundancy. So moving on and also to show some other aspects in the layout, uh, this roof required two rows. However, you'll note that there's, there's hips and valleys. And <clears throat> as you saw in in Rob's presentation, the damage that can be done by snow coming down, they added a third row in there to help prevent that. Another question I get quite often, and this one just came across my desk, is so something to point out here was the contractor originally put in the snow retention here where this blue line is. But then he's got an upper roof 
and yet another upper roof all dumping down. Um, I don't know if it's in litigation, but it was close. And so he came to me finally and said, what do, what do I got to do here? And it, it was a simple answer. When you've got an upper roof dumping snow onto a lower roof, you are creating that effect in essence, which Rob was showing where the snow is all piled up and then come shooting down the roof because you've got an upper roof that causes an avalanche. That's what was going on here. So then he sends it back to me and says, well, what if we put a row right here? I said, that's great, but we also need to look up here. Um, so those are things to consider in layout. If you have upper roofs, you always want to protect them if they're dumping onto a lower. Um, people that want to protect doorways, it's something we try to stay away from. There are, there are times where if you have a real short roof run, it's probably okay. But uh, if, if they're adamant that they protect the doorway, you'd want to add some rows back here um, longer than, than your initial row below. A lot of times when you do it and you figure it out, th there is no math to really do this that I've seen. Um, it's more guesswork than science, but oftentimes you end up where you have the same amount of snow retention on the roof as you would have if you'd have just done the whole eave anyway. The question is if you have a roof vent or some other roof obstruction that you want to protect, does the same principle apply? Correct. Uh, you can see here, this pipe is acting as a snow guard, and you can see the trajectory behind it. Um, now, had there been a row across the eave, you wouldn't see that quite as badly, but it's also a good idea to, to protect that pipe and put one behind it. If it's a shorter roof run, where that trajectory angle is not gonna be that much, I've, I've done jobs where you, know, you had a 10 foot from eave to ridge, there, you know, it, it becomes, it becomes more, um, well, it's, it's not mathematical science, it's. It becomes more discretionary. Yeah. When you calculate this tributary load, if you can, you're gonna find out usually that it's overloading this device. Now, if this roof length were real short, perhaps it wouldn't be. And so what he's saying, in a case like this, where it's overloading this device, you need to put some more in there. So the next one, you're, you're going to put from this point over to this point. And you may still be exceeding that thing. So now you're going to put another one from here to here. Well, by the time you do all that, if you'd have just run it all the way across that eave, job done. And the other thing is, we haven't talked about this, but when you do this, you are taking the tributary area of that whole big pie-shaped thing, and you're loading it into these four or five panels. Now you've got to ask yourself the question, remember that that may calculate to hold that load, but are those four panels fixed to the structure well enough? to take that whole load? Odds are they're not. And so now what you're doing is you're, you know, if those panels are, are fixed up here at the ridge, you're taking that entire tributary load through the panel up to the panel's fixed point, and you may be overloading that fixed point. You know, so there are a lot of pitfalls of, well, we just want to protect this door. So again, with layout, this job required two rows they opted to put that second row right up there by the pipes. Um, this was after their first snowstorm wiped out every pipe on the roof. And you'll note that those pipes are also pretty close to the ridge. They went in later and after they replaced the pipes, they braced them and then they put in kind of a snow diverter made out of sheet metal. Um, they did all of that before they even got the snow retention up there. So in valleys, snow likes to pile up in valleys. Uh, you saw the damage. I'm show you that picture again. Uh, and then look at a layout that has accommodated that problem. So it required three rows of assembly, I believe, or maybe it, it's four here. Um, they stair-stepped down the valley to prevent that. 
You can parallel a valley or stair step it. In general, I recommend a stair step unless it's just a smaller valley because you're following that valley which is pushing the snow kind of still down that same direction where if you're stair stepping it, you're holding it straight with the roof plane. <laughs>